Good morning, and welcome to Grace Valley Christian Center's Adult Sunday School. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, your day. Lord, it is another day that is a gift from you to be used to serve you. And Lord, as we look at Van Til this day, and in particular, look at how it is we should share the gospel with others. May we never forget, Lord, that the fundamental purpose of life for us as fallen people is to come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and then to tell others about him. And so, Lord, help us to pay attention to this, help us to learn, and help us to do a better job as we move forward in life in glorifying you, bringing honor to your name, and sharing the gospel. And so we ask your blessing on this time in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we're continuing on with our discussion here of the defense of faith. And for review, Van Til's most important point so far, first, the creator-creature distinction. And I, you know, the more you think about this, the more you realize how fundamental and, and foundational this really is. It should be the foundation of your worldview, your theology, everything in life. Also, the Bible is the ultimate standard for Christians, both for faith and for conduct. And we'll come to that again later today. There's a real challenge there for us whether or not that is true for us all the time in every aspect of life. And the triune God of the Bible is the only presupposition that makes creation intelligible and logic and science possible. We'll be talking more about that today again as well. And the only point of contact with the unbeliever is his innate knowledge that God exists and that he, meaning the unbeliever of course, is a sinner and has, is going to be judged by that God. And there are the scriptures I've suggested you know. So here's the outline. We've been discussing chapters five through seven on Christian apologetics. And uh, we are in the middle of talking about the, or we're getting ready to talk about the problem of method. We have finished the point of contact. So Van Til explains his presuppositional approach in the following way. He says, shall we, in the interest of a point of contact, admit that man can interpret anything correctly if he virtually leaves God out of the picture? Shall we, who wish to prove that nothing can be explained without God, first admit that some things at least can be explained without him? On the contrary, we shall show that all explanations without God are futile. Only when we do this do we appeal to that knowledge of God within men which they seek to suppress, the point of contact that you're trying to get in touch with. This is what I mean by presupposing God for the possibility of intelligent predication. And he also went on and said, the reformed apologist cannot agree at all with the methodology of the natural man. Disagreeing with the natural man's interpretation of himself as the ultimate reference point, the reformed apologist must seek his point of contact with the natural man in that which is beneath the threshold of his working consciousness in the sense of deity which he seeks to suppress. So last time I used the word, you know, that it's a subconscious knowledge of God. Whether that's correct or not, I'm not sure. These things are hard to, you know, be that specific about. But the Bible tells us that, that everyone knows God exists in some sense, right? And it's clear, I think, from my own personal experience and from talking with other people, it's clear that that is not a knowledge in the sense that they have sat down with a book and studied it and thought it all through carefully and come to a conclusion that, yes, God exists, and then just say, well, but I don't want to accept that. You know, that, that's not how it works. It's something within them, but they cannot escape it. And of course, most unbelievers will never admit that. I know I wouldn't have. I would have laughed at you or gotten angry with you or both, you know, but, but it's true. They cannot escape the knowledge they have. And that is the hook that we have, if you will, for speaking with an unbeliever. We know that that's true. And so that's the point Van Til's getting at. And I think it is the central point of his apologetic method, which all other apologetic methods really ignore or miss altogether because they're trying to add information. They're trying to tell the unbeliever things they don't know and convince them and everything. But in doing all of that, they do it by assuming the unbeliever's basic methodology is all okay. And Van Til says, no, 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 no. We've got to get, first of all, to get him to see his methodology is not okay. But what we're really after is we're really trying to make contact with that inner voice in this person that knows God exists and knows they are a sinner who is going to be judged by that God. That's what you're really trying to do. And you don't necessarily do that most effectively by saying that to the person, but that is what you are doing. So Van Til wrote, this point of contact must be in the nature of a head-on collision. 
If there is no head-on collision with the systems of the natural man, there will be no point of contact with the sense of deity in the natural man. But I, I want to point something out that Van Til doesn't. This head-on collision, we need to remember what Paul said, right? What Peter said, excuse me, in 1 Peter 3.15, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And here's the part I want us to pay attention to. But do this with gentleness and respect. So head-on collision doesn't sound so gentle <laughs> and respectful. I don't think that Van Til meant you go up and you whack the person in the face and you tell them, you know, you're a rebel against God and you know God exists and you need to just submit. You know, that's probably not the best apologetic method, right? So that's not what he means by a head-on collision. He means a head-on collision in the sense that you can't leave this unsaid. You can't leave the person's idea of themselves as the ultimate reference point as an unchallenged assumption. You have to point out the obvious difference here. That's what he means. He doesn't mean to not be gentle or respectful. So I wouldn't tell an unbeliever that he has no intellectual right to judge the validity of revelation. I don't think that's a good way to start myself. This is me, not Van Til. But you should point out that if he starts with the presupposition that God does not exist and or has not revealed himself to us in the Bible, then no amount of evidence is ever going to change that view. His presuppositions negate the very possibility. You have to point that out to somebody. You have to point out to them that your fundamental starting point determines your ending point. So unless you see that, you're not going to understand that, that the things I'm saying to you don't make any sense to you, but they don't make any sense to you because of your starting assumption. You assume there is no God, or that if there's a God, it's just some nebulous who knows what, and, and he hasn't communicated with us anyway, or if he has, it certainly isn't through the Bible. So then anything I say to you is going to fall on deaf ears. You have to make that point clear. And of course, we have the parable of the rich man and Lazarus to illustrate this point. Where, you know, we're told if someone returns from the dead, they will not believe, right? Look at Luke 16, 31. Also, look at the people who witnessed Christ perform all those miracles and healings and yet didn't believe. And consider Judas. Judas was with Jesus for three years. Think of all the things Judas witnessed and saw. He didn't believe. Evidence is not the problem. This is a major, major point in Van Til's apologetic. Information alone is not the problem. We aren't going to bring an unbeliever into the kingdom of God by supplying more information. Information is necessary. They need to know who Jesus is, what Jesus did, and so forth. But that isn't the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is their heart. The fundamental problem is that they are an enemy of God. Again, probably saying that to them is not the best way to get at that, but that is the fundamental problem. So, if we start with the assumption that God does exist and has revealed himself to us in the Bible, then we find that the resulting worldview is consistent and complete. That doesn't mean you can answer every question you could possibly ask, but it means it's complete in the sense that it has something to say, some reasonable answer, even if it's not as complete as we might like, about every major question we can ask in life, right? Where did we all come from? Why are things as bad as they appear to be? What is it we do to get out of that badness, <laughs> right? How are we saved? What happens when I die? You know, all of these things are answered, again, not maybe the way you would like them to be, but they are. It's a complete, consistent worldview, and there's plenty of evidence to corroborate that worldview. That's not why we believe it, but there's abundant evidence to corroborate that worldview. Everywhere you look, there's evidence to corroborate that worldview. Therefore, it will be apparent, and this is an important point for us as Christians, independent of the topic of apologetics, it will be apparent that we have no right to stand in judgment over those parts of God's words and works that we don't understand. When you're a child, and if you have a good father, right, you come to a realization your father loves you. So when your father, when you're running towards the street and you don't see the car coming, you just see your ball that went out there and you're running out there to get your ball and your father says, stop! You stop because your father said stop. You're trusting your father. You don't see the reason why he said stop, but you're trusting your father. We have to be the same way when we read things in the word of God that we don't quite understand, that don't seem quite right to us, that seem to be in opposition to what we think should be there or whatever, we have to stop. Say, but God said, and, I, and God is God, and I'm a creature, 
And so I submit to God's word. I come under his word, right? Completely and totally. There's the challenge. Do we do it completely and totally? And there's abundant examples in our culture of people who call themselves Christians but don't come under the word of God, aren't there? I don't have to give a bunch of illustrations of that. So Van Til explains in more detail what he means by a presuppositional apologetic. He says, to argue by presupposition is to indicate what are the epistemological and metaphysical principles that underlie and control one's method. So remember, epistemology is the study of how we know what we know, how we gain knowledge. Metaphysics is the study of the exist of being, what is there and what is its fundamental nature. And the presuppositions of a Christian, again, are that God exists and that God created everything, and that God controls everything, and that we learn by thinking God's thoughts after him. We learn by, first of all, being in submission to his word, and then from that place of submission, looking at the natural world around us, using the gifts God has given us, and our intellect, and trying to deduce things that we aren't told in, in the Bible. You know, the, the Bible doesn't tell us about the germ theory of disease, does it? All right, but we can use the minds God gave us, and, and nature around us, and we can learn about these things. But we do that all from the point of view of somebody who has got an epistemology that says, I know what I know only because God has given me a rational mind. God circumscribes how I'm to use that mind. God gives me a revelation that I am to believe first and foremost as I look at the world around me and so on. And a metaphysics that says God exists, God created, God ordains, and God has told us to some extent what's going to happen in the end, right? So all of that is fundamentally important. Now, most unbelievers will claim to prefer a neutral method of examining the evidence. I'm sure you've heard this at some point talking to somebody, right? Well, you believe the Bible and you were raised with that as a child. You know, for some of us that doesn't work because some of us weren't raised with that as a child, right? But, you know, they say, ah, you were raised with that as a child. You were brainwashed. You just believe that. But, you know, I, I'm a scientist. I, I look at the world and I use my reason and I understand what's out there. And I, so, so the idea is I'm neutral, right? I've, I've taken this neutral look at all of these facts in front of me and I've arrived at a conclusion. Well, that's nonsense. And we need to point out to people that that's utter nonsense. So Van Til wrote, in spite of this claim to neutrality on the part of the non-Christian, the reformed apologist must point out that every method, the supposedly neutral one no less than any other, presupposes either the truth, truth or the falsity of Christian theism. So I'm not speaking about anything else right here, just Christian theism, in other words, the God of the Bible. They may say they don't have a, an opinion on it. They may claim to be an agnostic like I did, which means what? You don't know, right? It says, I don't know and I don't think you can know. Well, that's kind of an arrogant way of being an atheist, right? It says, you're not, it says you're, you're not willing to say you're an atheist because you know that means you have to know everything, but you're calling yourself an agnostic. But have you ever met an agnostic that didn't live like an atheist? So they really are an atheist, right? They're just a little more arrogant than most atheists, that's all. But at any rate, this is an important point. Every worldview either says the God of the Bible does exist, or whether the person will admit it or not, the God of the Bible does not exist. This is not an issue about which you can be truly neutral. The natural man is suppressing the truth and is hostile to God. You can be neutral about some things, right? If I ask you, do you think a black hole really exists or is that just you know, a figment of physicists' imaginations? Well, I think you can be agnostic about that fact. You can say, I don't know whether a black hole exists or not. And it's probably not going to affect your life in any significant way, <laughs> all right? You cannot be neutral about whether or not God exists. Even if you think you are, or say you are, or someone says they are, they cannot be. It is not possible. Everything they do and think and say and the way they live their life assumes it's true or it's false. It's that simple. So Van Til's method of apologetics is what he calls indirect. A direct method, by the way, would be me coming to you and, 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 and saying to you, let me present you with some evidence and some proofs for the existence of God, and let me go and prove to you that the Bible is the Word of God. And That's assuming that we have an agreed upon standard for how to determine truth, isn't it? So I've assumed your method of doing that is all okay, and now we have an agreed upon method of how to examine the evidence, and so I'm presenting evidence to you, and I'm directly trying to argue to you that the evidence should show you that your view is wrong and my view is right. That's a direct method. Well, Van Til uses what he calls an indirect method. So he says, the issue between believers and non-believers in Christian theism cannot be settled by a direct appeal to facts, in quotes, 
or laws whose nature and significance is already agreed upon by both parties to the debates. The question is rather as to what is the final reference point required to make the facts and laws intelligible. In other words, it's a conflict of worldviews, in particular the fundamental presuppositions at the core of those worldviews. So we therefore approach the problem indirectly. And the first step, in general, the, there are variations on this, but in general the first step is to show the unbeliever that his worldview is inconsistent and incomplete. Now, to do that, we use his methods for the sake of argument. So you can go over to the unbeliever's camp, if you will, for a minute, and point out to him, by the way, I'm going to follow your assumptions for a minute. I'm going to assume human reason is the ultimate standard, and I'm going to assume that you're able to look at all these things you know, in, a, in an objective way and so forth. Let me go over to your camp and let's talk about some things. Where did the world come from? Where did the universe come from? Modern science says it had a beginning. Well, what was before that beginning? When they, they start talking about a multiverse or whatever, okay, fine. Well, that, that's, you know, the God of the gaps for the, for the natural man is what? Infinity. Okay, they talk about Christians having a God of the gaps. Well, the God of the gaps for the natural man is infinity. I don't understand how this universe got here, so I posit out of my imagination this infinite existing multiverse which pop, pops universes into existence all the time here and there. We just happen to be in one of them. Okay, that's an infinity. There's no evidence for it, right? But anyway, so you talk to him about that. And then you talk about where did life come from? How did non-living chemicals come together through some sort of random processes and mixtures and form living beings? Wow, you know, if there's some of that on the podcast and you can go look at Stephen Meyer's book, Signature in the Cell, it's fundamentally impossible. Okay, it's not just unlikely, it really is impossible. You can never say that probabilistically, but it is, all right? And then you say, okay, now even if we had existing, you know, little life forms, you know, we had amoebas running around and stuff, how do you get to conscience, conscious, sentient life, thinking life? How do you get to, from, from a universe ruled by nothing but, but purely deterministic laws and chance, how do you get to rational creatures that make real decisions? How do you get from a universe ruled by physical laws and, and purely natural things to creatures who all will agree, basically, almost, I shouldn't say all probably, almost every human being you will ever talk to will agree that there are things that are just fundamentally morally wrong. Not that they're illegal, they may also be that, but that they are fundamentally morally wrong. And then you have to ask, well, how can you say that? According to who? Who said they're wrong? You know, that assumes an authority, right? So there's a bunch of things you can do to an unbeliever's worldview to show them on their basis that their worldview has problems. You know, well, you think all people are good. Well, let's open today's newspaper. And find, are all people good? <laughs> are they getting better? <laughs> You know, uh, the answer is no. Of course, there's all kinds of things you can do. And of course, then they're going to come at you and say, well, Christians are no better. Look at all the things Christians do. And you say, yeah, precisely. Doesn't that prove my point? Uh, you know, Christians are sinners too. Not only that, but many people who claim to be Christians aren't Christian. But, but even real Christians sin. Look at King David, right? Adultery and murder, okay? So it just proves the point, doesn't it? We're all sinners. So you've got all kinds of things you can do with an unbeliever to show them that their worldview doesn't make any sense. And then you say, okay, now, here's the second step. Come over to the Christian worldview and show them that it's consistent and complete. But to do that, consciously tell them, assume my methods for a minute. So say, let me, let me bring you over into my worldview for a minute now. The God of the Bible exists. He alone is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, right, and his being, wisdom, power, holiness, and so on. He created all things, he sustains all things, he has ordained all things, and he's going to judge you. Now, and you have, you're a fallen creature with a sinful nature, you can do nothing but sin, when I properly understand and define sin. And now, let me show you that that's all completely consistent and, and logical and true and fits your experience and the world you live in and your own inner nature. Now, they're not going to agree with you, of course, most people. And many of them never will agree with you, but what are you doing? Inside, that person knows what you're saying is true. And if God has chosen to work on that person, you're now using that inward truth that they already possess, and you're reaching in and you're poking it. You know, you're, you're prodding it, right? And, and God's going to use that to cause that person to go off and, and think about this some more, and, or maybe even right then and there, who knows? But God's going to use that to bring this person to faith. 
Now, you can bring the person of faith other ways, as we've said before. God is sovereign, but this is the way that, or that, that honors God because it's following God's way of thinking about things and God's way of doing things. So this method works because God is the self-attesting God. We need to confront the unbeliever with his suppression of the truth. So the problem with classical apologetics is that even though reformed believers who use it understand that a person must be born again, they deny the total depravity of man and especially the noetic effects of sin if they act as if they can reason with him from a neutral point of view. That just reinforces the unbeliever's claim to neutrality and autonomy and does not properly honor God. That's the fundamental problem that Van Til was trying to solve. So in, his, in this discussion, the question of circular reasoning is likely to come up. Again, I suspect many of you have had this come up if you've had conversations with people, especially if you do it on the college campus, right? Not everybody thinks this way, but college students, you know, they're often taking a philosophy class or something, right? And, and so, you know, they, they have different problems from taking a philosophy class. I remember one young man who was really desperately trying to be existential, so he wasn't sure the wall he was leaning on really existed, you know, and things. But you know, so you run into all kinds of things talking to young college people, right? So one of them is that they'll say, well, you're guilty of circular reasoning. And of course, there's, Frame talks about narrow circles and broad circles, which I'm not all that convinced that's all that useful, but it has a point to it. So he would say a narrow circle, for example, is if you say, well, believe that the Bible is the Word of God because the Bible says it's the Word of God. Well, that's circular, and it's a very narrow circle. And Frame says there are broader circles you can draw, but the point here that's important is that, the un, is that circular reasoning, you know, the unbeliever says you use circular reasoning to presuppose the existence of God and then conclude that God exists, and therefore the claim is invalid. But the point is there is no reasoning about ultimate issues that is not circular. The unbeliever's no less than yours, all right? So... Every defense of any absolute standard for truth is circular. The unbeliever presupposes that human reason is the ultimate standard for determining truth. And this is implicit in his supposedly neutral approach, right? But that presupposition can only be defended how? By using human reason. He can't point to some other authority. He can't say, well, God said human reason is the right standard. <laughs> okay, that doesn't work, does it? So whatever your standard is, and there's really only two, but whatever your standard is, it can only be defended by that standard. In fact, I love the following quote. This is from Greg Bonson. It is only to be expected that in matters of ultimate commitment, the intended conclusion of one's line of argumentation will also be the presuppositional standard that governs one's manner of argumentation for that conclusion, or else the intended conclusion is not his ultimate commitment after all. So if I don't begin with the presupposition that God exists, God is true, God has revealed himself in the Bible, if I don't begin there and I try to conclude with that, what does that mean? Whatever I was using to get from A to B is really my ultimate standard, isn't it? And that's true for any ultimate standard you could possibly imagine somebody having. Circular reasoning is an essential thing. It cannot be avoided, so don't be attacked by that. Just point out, well, you're using circular logic too. It can't be avoided in this particular case. All right, Van Til also wrote, the natural man at bottom knows that he is the creature of God. He knows also that he is responsible to God. He knows that he should live to the glory of God. He knows that in all that he does, he should stress that the field of reality which he investigates has the stamp of God's ownership upon it but he suppresses his knowledge of himself as he truly is. He is the man with the iron mask. A true method of apologetics must seek to tear off that iron mask. Now, I don't think very many unbelievers will admit to any of this. So again, th this is Van Til saying this is what's true, not what they recognize as being true, not what they will admit to being true, but this is what's true, and you have the great benefit of knowing it's true because God has told you it's true. That gives you a huge edge in this argument, doesn't it? Because you know something about them they don't even know about themselves. So think about that for a minute. All right, the unbeliever's position is also a mixture of rational and irrational. When you read Van Til's writings, he very often talks about this, the, the fact that you know the unbeliever is rational and irrational at the same point in time. And, and he doesn't always make it clear what he means, but here's what he's talking about. 
It's rational because it's based on the use of logic and evidence to determine the truth. So the fundamental worldview of the, of the unbeliever says human reason is the appropriate ultimate standard. And so human reason, rational logic, and evidence, and argumentation, and so forth is how we arrive at truth. That's his epistemology, right? So it's rational to that extent. But it is irrational because on the unbeliever's presuppositions, his own mind and all of the facts he adduces in support of any proposition are the result of what Van Til likes to just call chance. So we're going to talk for a minute about what he means by chance. So in the unbeliever's view of things, how did the unbeliever get to where he is? Evolution, right? So through some process of random mutation and natural selection and so forth, some set of natural laws, which are again either deterministic or random, he grew out of the slime. Right? The same chemicals that make up the earth and the stars and so forth somehow came together and made animals and animals all continued to evolve until they arrived at him. So he has this brain that works through some magic. And, and that brain is supposed to be believable when it makes deductions about the whole world it lives in. Why? Where's, where's the rational basis for that? That's irrational at its core, really, in a sense. And so Van Til wrote, the idea of pure chance has been inherent in every form of non-Christian thought in the past. It is the only logical alternative to the position of Christianity, according to which the plan of God is back of all. I, I quote this because it's the closest he ever comes to telling you what he means by the word of chance, but <laughs> by the word chance. But if you look through a lot of his different writings, and, you, and this is a good one, by chance, Van Til means a world controlled by impersonal physical laws. I really almost wish he would have said impersonal rather than chance, because that's really the thing he's getting at here, um, rather than one that's created and controlled by God. But the idea that it's chance is okay. Um, because, again, all of the physical laws of our universe are either deterministic or random. And so, in a sense, anything that isn't purely deterministic in how it occurs is because of randomness. So, and in such a world, there can be no truly rational creatures to sit around and think about that world, as I just talked about. But lest you think that Christians are the only ones who would say that, let me show you an honest pagan. Consider what Marvin Minsky, a professor at MIT, wrote. And I, I should have looked it up. I'm not sure Marvin Minsky's still alive. I'm almost certain he's no longer a professor at MIT because he was there a long time ago. He wrote this back in the 90s. But a very famous book called The Society of Mind. He was a cognitive psychologist who studied how it is we think and so forth. And he wrote the following. The physical world provides no room for freedom of will. So what he means is no room for us making real decisions. You, you don't make real decisions. You don't have real volition. Okay, because he understands you're controlled by physical laws, which are deterministic or random. You're just atoms in motion doing what atoms do. There's no volition in that. Okay, that's what he means here. But that concept is essential to our models of the mental realm. Well, shouldn't you stop at that point and say, I've got a problem? <laughs> you know, and a, a concept that I fundamentally know, according to my worldview, is, is absolutely untrue and impossible, is essential to my model. Ooh. As an engineer, that, that kind of gives me the creeps. <laughs> you know, you know, it's like, not, not a good model. And he said, we are virtually forced to maintain that belief even though we know it is false. Well, that's an example of the irrationality of the non-Christian worldview. We should confront unbelievers with this kind of problem. Let me show you just one more simple example of the kind of thing that unbelievers say and do. In, in this book, e, Why Does E Equal MC Squared, by guys named Cox and Forshaw, who all through the book, by the way, are very highly anti-Christian, although it's an outstanding book if you're interested, but you have to ignore the slights against Christianity. They quote Eugene Wigner stating a position that a number of scientists have expressed over the years, but this expresses it well. He says, the miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. Now, maybe you don't get that if you're not into physics and so forth, right? But the, the idea which has been expressed by many people many times is why is it that human beings sit around, most mathematics, if you don't know, by the way, like calculus and so forth, they, they were derived to solve certain problems, but in another sense, they were derived in, in people sort of looking at it as its own science, its own entity, and sort of saying, you know, what do I do next? And, and kind of the beauty of it and the beauty of the proofs and so forth. And the question is, why should this abstract thing called mathematics, which human beings have created, why should it so beautifully describe the actual world we live in? Why does that work? That, that just seems kind of 
a bit strange. As he says, miracle, miracle, right? Well, here's what Van Til wrote. Moreover, God has adapted the objects to the studies of knowledge that, that the law has... Uh, I've got something, a word there missing or something. Moreover, God has adapted the objects to the, oh no, the objects to the subjects of knowledge that the laws of our minds and the laws of the facts come into fruitful contact with one another is due to God's creative work and to his providence. So in other words, why does human mind coming up with the laws of mathematics and so forth end up very well describing the universe we live in? Because God made it that way. Because God made your mind and God made the universe and so this is why it works. This is not a miracle in, in the sense he means miracle. It's not a big mystery. It's because God created it. All right? So Van Til, Van Til deals with two objections that he foresaw would be raised to his method. And he says the first objection that suggests itself may be expressed in the rhetorical question, do you mean to assert that non-Christians do not discover truth by the methods they employ? And he says the reply is that we mean nothing so absurd as that. By the way, you will find lots of critiques of Van Til out there who say he says that, that unbelievers don't know anything. And the reality is he does say that sometimes. <laughs> but you have to read more of him to understand that's not exactly what he means. All right? So here he says very clearly, we mean nothing so absurd as that. The implication of the method here advocated is simply that non-Christians are never able to, and therefore never do, employ their own methods consistently. So in other words, the Bible, the God of the Bible is the necessary presupposition. Without him, there is no coherent and adequate explanation for the existence of the universe or of man. And therefore, there's also no adequate explanation for why man's methods that the unbeliever uses should work. Now, I think this argument, it, it's true. I, I'm convinced that it's true philosophically. As I said once before in a slightly different context, I think it's a little bit weak in the sense I wouldn't use it with unbelievers very much because an unbeliever may very well admit, okay, I have no philosophical fundamental basis for saying that when I perform this experiment tomorrow, the result will be the same as it is today. I only have, you know, thousands of years of human experience that these things have done the same every day to believe that it will do the same tomorrow. And that's the best I can do. Okay, so they could be completely honest and kind of undercut this. But, but Van Til's point is that, is that they have no real fundamental epistemological metaphysical basis for believing that their worldview should work consistently. Then he says, the second objection may be voiced in the following words. While a Christian can prove that his Christian position is fully as reasonable as the opponent's view, there is no such thing as an absolutely compelling proof that God exists or that the Bible is the word of God, just as little as anyone can prove its opposite. Now, it's true, he says, that no method of argument for Christianity will be acceptable to the natural man. The Reformed apologist maintains that there is an absolutely valid argument for the existence of God and for the truth of Christian theism. He cannot do less without virtually admitting that God's revelation to man is not clear. Now, notice here he said, it's true that no method of argument for Christianity will be acceptable to the natural man. And look at Luke 8, 10. He said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables. Why did Christ speak in parables? So that. Though seeing, they may not see. Though hearing, they may not understand. Quoting from Isaiah chapter 6, right? It's a difficult point, but God hides the truth in a sense from those whom he chooses not to reveal it to. And I would say he does that in two ways. One, the primary one is, the primary one is that you have to be born again. The man without the spirit does not understand the things that come from the spirit of God. Whoops, I meant to go back to this. So, but getting back to this quote, the idea here is, you know, he says the Reformed apologist maintains that there is an absolutely valid argument for the existence of God and the truth of Christian theism. Van Til is very, very strong on this point many times that he doesn't like the idea that you only prove the probability that God exists or something, you know, right? And, you know, the reality is what he's saying is true, but again, I don't think it's the strongest thing to say to an unbeliever because what he's saying here fundamentally is that if you start off from the unbeliever's worldview, of course, and you start trying to make arguments and build up, you're going to arrive at nothing more than a probable argument. You, you can come up with an argument that says, well, there, there ought to be a God. There needs to be a first cause, as Aristotle said, right? Or whatever. So there's, you can make arguments that show that, well, God probably exists. 
And you can even make arguments like William Lane Craig has made that, that if God created the universe, he must be a personal, rational being who makes real choices because if it was just some cosmic force that created the universe, it would have happened infinitely long ago. We won't go into that right now, but anyway. So you can argue that God has to be personal and so forth. You can make probable arguments. And Van Til says, no, no, no. We make absolutely certain valid arguments that God exists, and not just God, the God of the Bible exists. Now, when he says that, what does he mean? Well, he means from the Christian presuppositions, they are absolutely valid arguments, but he points out right here that they are not always going to be arguments that persuade others, all right? So he fully recognizes that. They may be, you know, a valid argument does not necessarily mean a persuasive argument. There are perfectly valid logical arguments that will not persuade. All right, so Van Til is properly insistent that we must defend Christian theism, not just the existence of some God, with a little g here. So therefore, we must bring up the subject of God's infallible revelation, the Bible. Don't ever let yourself go very far, and this doesn't mean you never do it at all, but don't ever let yourself go very far into sharing the gospel with somebody without ever mentioning the Bible. Now, you know, sometimes if somebody says something to you, you can respond to what they've said and get into a discussion about something to try and show them their worldview has a problem and so forth. It's leading somewhere, and you know it's leading somewhere. They may not know that, but, you know, and you don't mention the Bible. That's okay. But, but if you're really witnessing to somebody, at some point, fairly early on, you have to get to the Bible because how do we know about God? From the Bible, right? So you can't leave that out. So Van Til wrote, if the whole debate in apologetics is to be more than a meaningless discussion about the that of God's existence. So he calls that a meaningless discussion. So if we sit around and talk endlessly about Aquinas' and Aristotle's proofs for the existence of God and so forth and don't go any further, Van Til says that's a meaningless discussion. All right? Then the question... Uh, um, and, and uh, okay, so meaning this discussion about the that of God's existence and is to consider what kind of God exists. So if we're going to get past that and get to what kind of God exists, then the question of God's revelation to man must be brought into the picture. That God meant to bring covenant breakers back into covenant communion with himself through the covenant of grace could in no wise be discovered other than by supernatural redemptive revelation, i.e. the Bible. That's the only place you're going to learn about that. You're not going to get it from creation. So he also wrote, we cannot subject the authoritative pronouncements of scripture about reality to the scrutiny of reason because it is reason itself that learns of its proper function from scripture. If man is not autonomous, if he is rather what scripture says he is, namely a creature of God and a sinner before his face, then man should subordinate his reason to the scriptures and seek in the light of it to interpret his experience. And what are we told in Isaiah 55, 9? As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. This, again, is a point of fundamental importance to us as Christians, independent of witnessing. If you really are born again, if you really believe the God of the Bible is who he says he is, and the Bible is his word, you have no right you are sinning if you stand in judgment over that word at any point. Now, that doesn't mean you don't spend time and effort making sure you're interpreting his word correctly, right? Everybody always goes back to Galileo, and, you know, they talk about, well, you know, people thought the Bible taught that the whole universe revolved around the earth, and the earth was the center of the universe, and all this. So that isn't what the Bible teaches. People did think it taught that, but that, wasn't, that isn't what it teaches. So we have to be careful that we're interpreting correctly but we have no right to stand in judgment over the Word of God. Um, Bill Craig and some other people have said that Martin Luther talked about the magisterial and the ministerial uses of human reason. Uh, I've actually searched now quite a bit for that, and I can't find it in, in um, Martin Luther, although I'm quite sure he would agree with it. But it's a useful distinction. And the idea is, what is a magisterial use of reason? Well, a magistrate is one who stands in judgment, right? So a magisterial use of human reason is I stand over the Bible and I say, well, that part, that can't be right because that doesn't make sense. That's magisterial use of reason. The ministerial use of reason, what's a minister? One who serves. Ministerial use of reason is I use my reason to its fullest capability to understand God's word and to stand under God's word and to obey God's word. So there's a proper use of human reason and there's an improper use of human reason. And it's, again, a very important question for all of us to ask ourselves. Which do we do? And I'm quite confident we all, at one point in time or another, have stood in 
judgment over the word of God on something. And we need to repent of that whenever we see it in ourselves and come under the word of God. So Van Til wrote, when these matters, namely that our reason should be subordinate to God's revelation, are kept in mind, it will be seen clearly that the true method for any Protestant with respect to the scripture and Christianity, and with respect to the existence of God, theism, must be the indirect method of reasoning by presupposition. In fact, it then appears that the argument for the scripture as the infallible revelation of God is to all intents and purposes the same as the argument for the existence of God. So in other words, he's saying, don't, don't argue for the validity of the Bible by going and talking about all of the evidence for the truthfulness of the Bible. All of that evidence has use. I've gone over it in the podcasts because it has great use for Christians, right? Because it helps us to see all of the evidence that corroborates what we believe to be true. But that's not why we believe the Bible. And what Van Til is saying is, is Christian theism is a unit. We learn about the God of the Bible from the Bible. It's the God of the Bible and the Bible together that we are to defend. We don't try and first defend God and then go and defend the Bible or try and validate the Bible and then use it to get to God. It's, it's Christian theism as a unit, and so it's the fundamental presupposition, again, that leads you there. So Van Til speaks of non-reformed apologetics as building, on the, as building the first story of the house on the natural man's presuppositions and then trying to take tack on a second story that brings him to biblical Christianity. So he wrote, if the natural man is given permission to draw the floor plan for a house and is allowed to build the first story of the house in accordance with his own blueprint, the Christian cannot escape being controlled in a large measure by the same blueprint when he wants to take over the building of the second story of the house. So we've talked about this before, but this two-story idea of truth. We have to be sure we shatter that notion when we're talking to people. The idea that there's the bottom story, which is science, reason, logic, rationality, publicly verifiable facts and things, and that that's all where the world operates. And then there's this second story of sort of nebulous feelings and emotions and religion and what you think and what I think, and we can both be right even though we contradict each other and, you know, no got to get away from that whole idea. Don't allow that first story to be there because that first story is a myth. It's not real. It's not solid. And you can't build on it. So we must be wary of this two-story view of truth, which essentially puts the bottom story, uh, puts reality in the bottom story and private opinions in the top. I'm not going to talk, talk about it at all, but we've gone over this a little bit before in various places. But Nancy Piercy's book, Total Truth, um, is a very good book on this. I would recommend it. Uh, she was a follower of Francis Schaeffer, who was a student of Van Til's, although he didn't faithfully follow Van Til's apologetic. But that's a good book, anyway, for thinking about these things. Biblical Christianity is truth. It is not opinion. And you need to have that solidly in mind. And so with that, we're done with the problem of method, and we're ready to talk about authority and reason with the little, well, you know what? We don't have enough time left to start on this, so we're going to stop here, and we'll get into authority and reason next week, and we will finish up next week, I promise. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, that we have the truth in your word, and we thank you for new birth, Lord God, that by your Holy Spirit you have opened our eyes to see and our ears to hear and our hearts to understand and believe that we may obey the words of your law. And Lord, we ask your blessing on this day. Be with us as we worship you and as your word is preached and as we hear it and put it into practice. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And you're